Hey, new trust economy out there. I'm so excited to bring you someone who I'm bringing him right after tax season and he is a tax expert and we have had some really fun conversations. So I am bringing you today, Drew Kurnowski. He is from Archer Tax Group in Longmont, Colorado, and he's got some interesting ideas about how to handle your cryptocurrency and how to deal with all of that as you head into maybe getting a better tax season next year because <laughs> maybe you got hit this year. So, hey, Drew, welcome welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're on. Yeah, thanks for having me on. You look pretty well rested for a guy who's probably <laughs> pulled a few late nights in the last week. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Well, I, I think I slept in a little bit too much this morning and had to run to the office, but it's all good <laughs> Well, I'm so glad you're here. So yeah. when we when we talked, I guess what what show? I guess it would have been Chain Exchange. That's what yeah. we met last oh, year. Yeah, yeah we awesome did. I, <laughs> yeah, I did a little interview with you. So that's on the website newtrusteconomy.com, and so there's a little bit of video of us um, talking there. And um, but you and I met. And we were having a late night chat with drinks and everything. But you mm -hmm. had some really cool ideas about, you know, offsetting your 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 tax year and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. So let's talk about like what's going on first and get a base yeah, for what's going on and how do people treat cryptocurrency in their tax years and, and what's going on with that in tax wise? Yeah. What's it categorized like? Right. So, so the, the general transaction is a capital gain. You know, every kind of crypto transaction is going to either have a capital gain or a capital loss. That's inherent just in, in the, the marketplace. What changes it is, you know, how did you receive it? Did you purchase it? Did you get paid in crypto? And there might be additional taxes on there as well. So we've seen a whole host of, you know. Why is that a difference? So if you yeah. got paid in it, it's like you earned it. So it's like income. Correct. Right. And I guess, you know, I should probably backtrack a little bit. And um, the, the way that we calculate the capital gain is you take whatever the sale price is minus your basis. So if you buy it, you're setting your basis by, you know, basically paying that USD equivalent for it. Um, if you're earning it, it's being given that money in lieu of cash. And so that service has that value and that establishes the basis there. Now, what most people don't realize is when you receive that as a payment, we have to subtract out expenses and then treat you know, that as if it were self-employment income or if you're running it through a corporation or a partnership, you know, accounting for it effectively there as well. And it's, it's actually a really great way for people to accumulate crypto is to get paid in crypto because one, processing fees are way, way lower. Yeah. Two, it's a lot easier to get paid from international clients. We've picked up quite a few of those in the last year and it's been really, I've had a couple of clients that have paid me with a bank wire and some that have paid me with crypto and I always prefer the crypto. It's a lot easier. There's a lot less moving pieces and it clears, you know, in minutes instead of days. Uh, wow. I hadn't but, really thought about that, but you're yeah. right. Yeah. That is always oh, yeah. a problem. Yeah. And then, the, you know, there's no negotiating on, on currency rates either. You know, I want four Bitcoin for my services and, you know, pay me, pay me by the state. And we're good to go. It's, it's a, a great way to really accumulate it because it does set it at the higher basis. So even if you're, um, business doesn't make any money, you know, let's say you get your cell phone bill lumped in there and, uh, you know, you're paying suppliers and things like that. And you're paying them in cash, which are holding onto your crypto. You can have higher basis crypto without having to pay anything essentially for it. You know, you're just paying out cash out of it. And then when you sell it, you either, either something at a loss, if you were lucky enough to earn it in 18 and then sell it before the end of the year, or, you know, ideally you'd be able to sell it, you know, in a bull run here. And part of the thing that I want to talk about tonight too is, you know, what do we do in the next bull run? I think a lot of investors really got caught in this trap of things were moving so quickly and it was like a month of absolute chaos and ICO, you know, insanity, prices tripled. And then, you know, by the end of month two, everything had collapsed. And a lot of people put themselves in some tax situations that, you know, we were really unwinding the damage of, you know, especially in this tax year's filing, but a little bit in 17 as well. And so knowing how your choices impact you from a tax perspective can make all the difference on whether or not you're going to have a good year or, or a bad year as far as you know whether or not you owe the tax man any money well before we get into that i want to i want to yeah. backtrack a little bit and so i mean how did a tax guy get involved in cryptocurrency <laughs> that's what i want to know <laughs> yeah absolutely so I, I used to work with truck drivers um and there's a lot of specific nuanced laws in tr taxes for truck drivers really? and i've also worked for one of those you know if you owe ten thousand dollars or more to the irs give us a call, we'll help you settle. So I understand how the IRS goes after things on an administrative standpoint. You know, everyone thinks that, well, okay, we get a massive liability and they're just gonna come take your stuff. There's, you know, a good two year process before the IRS can seize anything. And a lot of the, you know, dealing with the IRS and even audits is just paperwork. You know, making sure that you understand what needs to be submitted when, how to, to you know, formulate an argument, knowing what the law actually states. Um, so we, we kind of had a natural um, pull to, cryptocurrency, but I had a, a trucker who was a trucker by day 
and Silver Trader by night. And he, he you know, as, as all good career stories start, he said, hey, there's this post on Reddit. Do you think you can answer it? And it was all about, you know, the 2014 uh, IRS notice that basically establishes, you know, what crypto is, how is it taxed, what do we do with it? And um, in, in that situation, everyone was of the mind because it was, oh gosh, early 2017 of like kind exchange applies to crypto. It finally gathered enough value that people had to start seriously thinking about how it impacted their taxes. Um, and so we came in and we broke a lot of hearts with our stance of like kind exchange doesn't apply to crypto. Um, we spent, I mean, that, that was part of the reason why we were at the, the chain exchange was we were talking about the specifics of the law and why it's not really a good idea to claim it as like kind and how people are claiming it wrong. Because once again, it all boils down to paperwork and most of the people aren't doing the paperwork required to even claim like kind exchange. So, so, so explain for some of our yeah. audience who may not even know what that means. What's a like kind exchange? Yeah. So it, it used to be any kind of asset that was like kind and the, the actual section of the revenue code is 1031. So you, you'll hear like kind or 1031 exchange used pretty interchangeably. But the idea is when you sell a property and you have some sort of capital gain in it, as long as you pull it into, I think it's 45 days, or at least identify another property by 45 days, um, you can roll that capital gain into the new property and reduce the basis for depreciation against the gain instead of having to recognize the gain. So it's used a lot in real estate. You know, you go I was going to say, it's probably used a lot in real estate. Right. So. And, and as of 2018, it can only be used for real estate. So it used to be like vehicles, it used to be machinery, but as of the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, updates at the end of 2017, they said as of 2018, it's only for real estate transactions. So do you think that's a part of why a lot of people are getting into unusual hot water this year with their taxes as we've been hearing it? <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, at least the biggest case to come to mind that comes to mind for me is the John McAfee. And I think that has less to do with, you know, the, the like kind rules and more with uh, him trying to evade taxes and being a conscientious objector very publicly. You know, if, if you're going to. So tell, not, tell people yeah. the story because I, not everybody has heard of him. Yeah, so uh, allegedly, and I've actually filed a Freedom of Information Request Act to try and get more information on it. Ooh. Unfortunately, you know, they won't they won't give me any more information unless John McAfee signs off on it. So if he's watching, I hope he is. Yeah. We would love we would love to tell your story and, and you know show to the world what's what's going on and why this is such a big deal. But what what they're alleging is you know he has all these unpaid taxes and he basically went on Twitter and said I haven't filed tax returns and I think it was like seven years or something crazy like that. You know I'm not going to to file returns, come and get me, and then basically jumped on a boat and is somewhere in the Caribbean where they don't extradite, allegedly. <laughs> so, I mean, keep in mind, this is, this is all, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but it's, it's a really good case on, you know, if you're going to do something, you know, if the less public you are about it, if you're in the wrong, the better off you're going to be, because the IRS doesn't take kindly to, to tax evaders. Um, <laughs> the, the joke that I've been going on, you know, saying for a few years now is, you know, you get all these guys on these YouTube channels that just sit there like, hey, you know, Crypto is, is free of tax. Like, I'm not going to pay my taxes. You should either, if you like our show, donate below. So now you've got to take the video confession. Yes, yeah, really. A link, a link not to a, a Bitcoin good wallet. Plan. Yeah. <laughs> link, link to a, a Bitcoin wallet that you can trace the chain and see where it's gone. And they have you basically admitting on camera that you have no intention of paying taxes. So your argument of, um, oh gosh, what's the, the legal term? basically culpability. You know, I, I didn't know that I was doing something wrong. I wasn't malicious. I wasn't being intentional about it. That, that argument. Was really well, good. So and I have, we, we, I did an interview with my good friend, Aaron Young on uh, product launch hazards, one of my sister podcasts here. Yeah. And, um, and he was just, you know, there is a, there are rules in the federal government and they can come after you for things you should have known. And right. so, so yeah. that would probably fall into should have known this. And oh, now you're sure. really still in trouble, even if, you know, it wasn't as blatant. Yeah. Well, I think the hard thing too. So, I mean, being such a student of tax law, I always take for granted of like how much I actually know in that space and how much is in common. And, and they don't teach it in schools, which is unfortunate, but it's all publicly available. And there, there hasn't been a ton of information that's been put out on it, but they do have one notice and it's, it's been kind of a hot topic that, you know, if you just search cryptocurrency taxation, IRS, I'm sure it's probably the second or third, you know, post on there, there's a, a real argument that, you know, look, you should have known that you were trading something of value. It operates kind of like a stock, you know, whether or not the wash rules apply or, you know, um, you know, what accounting methods can we use? That's probably up for a little bit of debate. However, you know, you're still going to have a gain somewhere. You, you had less, now you have more and you've got more of these tokens. 
that that boils down to a real simple calculation for the IRS. Right, right. Now, so just holding them doesn't mean anything. Yeah. It's when you go to sell them. And so, it, yeah, right. So, you know, that's what I want everyone to realize here. It's just because you happen to have that in your asset base. It doesn't mean anything. It just, you know, if you go to sell yeah. it, if you go to tra transfer it, if you go to do any of those things, now you have to consider what you're doing there. So, exactly. Drew, I'm a little bit of a tax geek. I'm going to admit that, <laughs> which is just so funny because people would not realize that about yeah, me. Welcome to the team. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you know, but I think, I, you know, the thing is that so interests me about it is that, is that the, there's a strategy behind how you might run your business, how you might right. operate. And that's what really like, that's why you and I hit it off so well as we oh, were yeah. talking that night. Um, so at our friend, Adrian Ashley's, I should just give a shout out to Adrian. Right. You know, she's got a great app that she's working on called Lolly. And so she was throwing this party and we were starting to, to geek out on some tax ideas. And we were talking really about a, a lot of Amazon sellers, which is something right. that we deal with in our podcast. And they've been hit with this like crazy under understanding of what inventory is oh, yeah. it's a yep. huge problem for them that they just don't understand that just because it's not sitting in their house or in their garage or in their warehouse it's sitting out on amazon stock doesn't right. mean it's not your inventory and so they right. messed up on that but you had a really interesting idea and you said to do that the same thing works for bitcoin and for cryptocurrency as well and that is to offset your tax year so that you can falls into different brackets. So you don't get hit like, you know, having to pay everything April 15th. It might come yeah. in a different time of year when right. you have more money, when you have more revenue, which for Amazon sellers is usually the fourth quarter of the year. Right. So if you, and so I remembered that and thought, that's so smart because so many of the companies and brands that I used to work for used to close their tax year in June, which right. would mean that they would be paying right at the height of when they have the most income. Exactly. And that fiscal, fiscal tax years are pretty common. You know, in some some cases, you know, I've seen CPA firms that deliberately set their uh, company fiscal year to be after tax season because you're not going to focus on your own return. That's right. I, I filed an extension. I'll I'll be probably doing that mid June. Um, but looking at you know the the way to structure, I mean, you have to do it through an entity. You know, if you're going to be trading in, in that regards, you have to understand that you know you do have a capital gains flow through, depending on what kind of entity that you you know set up and we could probably talk for two hours on the specifics of that. And that's, you know, that's, that's one way to, to kind of consider, you know, how do we actually leverage, you know, crypto. The other thing that I think a lot of people have missed too is crypto backed loans are, are a great way to pull the value out without having to actually pay any tax on it. Because when you're borrowing against it, it doesn't constitute a sale. Oh, now you've so, my ears. I've not really oh yeah. heard. So what are these crypto backed loans? I haven't heard yeah. about them. So, so I think the biggest companies, so we've got Salt here in Denver that does them. Um, Make or Die, their whole system is is basically, a, the CDP is a crypto back loan um, for Dai. And then you've got um, Unchained Capital, um, BlockFi. There's a couple companies that are kind of sprung up in the last year. And I've talked to a handful of the CEOs and just said, look, from a tax perspective, you know, if I'm going to encourage my clients to, to do this, you know, how, how are you storing the tokens? Because that does matter. There's been a couple court cases for, um, stock back loans where they basically traded their stocks or their options to this company um, and they set it up like a loan, but that company that went and sold the stock underneath that, I think it's the Deverium Capital is the, the court case, I think it's Deverium Capital versus the commissioner, um, that, you know, basically they weren't holding it in a capacity like a loan. Because you think about like a home sale or a, a mortgage, when you get a mortgage against your home, it's not the sale of your home, it's borrowing against the value of that asset. Right. Now, if the bank were to sell that out from underneath you and sell your home, then that would constitute a sale and you, you know, basically have null and void. You know, a lot more contract issues than that, but you know, yeah. for simplicity's sake. But the idea being that if you want to unlock the value, but you want to stay long in a position, putting it into a loan like that will allow you to at least pull some of the value out. And usually it's about 35% loan to value is what I've seen kind of on average for, for these loans. But then you can invest that loan into a business and get that started. Um, you can actually write off that interest if you're using it for business purposes. Right. as a, a, business, a bona fide business expense. So we've got, you know, some miners too that they're mining all this Bitcoin and they've got all these expenses that they have to pay, but they didn't want to stay long in the Bitcoin. So they pull this Bitcoin together and they borrow against that Bitcoin and then they use that loan to fund operations. And then they're just paying off the loan and the interest as they go along and maintain the position. So there's all sorts of ways that you can structure. I mean, it, 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 honestly, all taxes boil down to, can we think far enough ahead what do we need? You know, what do I need dollars in my hands for my living expenses? What living expenses are actually business expenses? And what, what's my timing? You know, if I can wait and stretch things out, you know, it's sometimes better to sell in the next tax year than it is to sell right away. 
we've had some clients that balance, you know, they sell a little bit on December 31st and they sell even more on January 1st. And that makes a huge difference for the time value of money for them. Right. Yeah. Oh, I so agree. You know, it, it was getting me thinking also is that, you know, as you're doing uh, many, many people are working on their business plans, you right. know, and doing like I'm working on one with my, with putting part of my entity in blockchain and looking at what that is going to be and starting to think about the implications of that and how I might fund that and what I might oh, yeah. do. So, you know, the tax implications are high. And so you really do need to think about that and plan that ahead and plan that as a part of how might I fund this? And then how might I be able to continue to fund that because there are going to be continuing costs that go on that. Um, so oh, yeah. how can I make sure that there's value there um, that's adding back to me? So I love the oh, idea yeah. of the, you know, of the loans and, um, and all of that. It would be really interesting um, to look at from a business standpoint, from a business planning standpoint. So sure. now, now you've got my brain worrying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, the other thing too, I think a lot of entrepreneurs miss out on is, you know, they always just jump into business and they have a sole member LLC and they don't realize that just goes in your schedule C on your tax return. If you're crossing over and I, I keep like a range because I want to make sure that anytime that we do anything from a tax perspective or tax mitigation, that the dollars spent to do this are going to be offset by significantly more tax. So we always try to balance, you know, I don't want you spending $500 to save 25 cents. I'd rather you just pay the tax on the 25 cents. Right. So, yeah. One thing that a lot of people I think are, are kind of afraid of um, is setting up an LLC and then electing S corp status. If you're a, a small business and you're making over $70,000 of profit, just making that election to an S corp and then paying yourself a salary, you know, let's say you do 30 or $40,000 of salary, the remaining 30,000, you know, $40,000 salary comes back to you at income tax only. Most entrepreneurs don't know that every dollar they make in that schedule C of profit gets hit with income tax and then self-employment tax as well. And so there's been a couple of clients that we've worked with that we were actually able to cut their tax bill in half just by switching a, you know, flipping a switch, on yeah. their, their tax form, same dollars, same income, uh, but it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I get in this little battle with my family over a tax time every year because my, you know, my parents got hit with the um, no longer able to deduct your property taxes, mm -hmm. which was like a big, big deal. Oh, yeah. um, they're expensive here in California. So that oh, was like gosh, a big yeah. hit for a, a couple of retirees, right? Yeah. And so my dad was like, really, I mean, he didn't end up having to pay in, but he was really close and he was oh, yeah. that. So, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, we just got a refund and it was quite sizable. And he was like, yeah. what did you do? I goes, you know, I have a business, dad. I was like, it, you know, we're an escort for oh, a yeah. reason. And we did it not, we did it from the very beginning because my husband is my partner. So mm -hmm. that makes you a single member LLC if you're married. And so that doesn't right. help either. So you don't end up with that member based LLC. You just end up like you're a sole, sole entity. So mm -hmm. we did it from the very beginning. Um, of course we make more than 70,000 in our business, right, so, right. you know, so it, of course now it's beneficial, but even when we started, we did it that way as yeah. well because we knew there were so many tax benefits and it has always benefited us. And then I had to go and help my daughter and her and her husband do their first joint tax return together. And, you know, they don't have a ton of income, but he's yep. a geographer and he operated like a sole proprietor. And I was, yeah. I was like, I can't do anything about, you didn't make enough money, you didn't do any right. of this, but I can't do anything. You still have to pay yourself employment tax because right. you didn't elect. Right. But good news. It's a hundred bucks cheaper than the, than the corporation fee. So oh, yeah. be happy about that. <laughs> I was like, but, well, and out in California, I mean, so Colorado, it's, you know, 50 bucks a year to have it's, the, it's 800 and, here. Yeah. You guys, you guys get raked over the coals and, and, you know, more power to, I, I I've been out to California. I'm a little bit partial to my mountains out here versus yes. y'all's mountains. <laughs> you have the ocean. So I'll, I'll give you guys that. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that, you know, I, I think honestly, the biggest changeover that we've seen with the tax law updates is those that were wholly W2 kind of got pushed to the limit and, and either had to pay a little bit in or, you know, were barely on the cusp of getting a refund because they did change the withholdings. I mean, that, that happens every time that they make an update. Yeah. And, and, and they weren't really aware of that. Like, I don't think, you know, as an employer, I wasn't even aware that I should advise them to do that, which I should yeah. have, but I just thought, I thought it was going to net out close enough for them. But for the yeah. ones who have homes, that's right. really where the difference happened because of, of, you know, their tax basis shifted so much that they should have withheld more. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, that's just the thing is, I mean, it's, it's so difficult and the, the dependents uh, dropped off as well. So, you know, you, you've got your um, standard deduction doubled, but if you've got five kids, you used to get, you know, what, 4,000 a kid yeah. off your income and then the standard deduction of 12 or, or more, you know, if, if you're in a high income uh, state income tax or high property value area, uh, 
And so there's, there's been kind of an interesting mix of some people have really benefited from it. Some have really gotten kicked in the teeth, you know, by it. But I think one thing to remember too is, I mean, everyone always dogs on, on corporate tax rates, but when the corporate tax rate drops from 35 to 21%, sometimes the best thing to do is to create a, a C corp that manages your S corp. You become truly passive in your S corp and you lock in a 21% tax rate. And if you don't, once again, if you don't need that money, yeah. you can use that to fund, you know, management fees, and then run your payroll through the, the C-Corp where you actually can get more uh, payroll benefits than you can through your S-Corp. Let's get just going down the rabbit hole here of all these different things. No, no, Andrew, you know, I'm going to be talking crazy. to you this next year because I, yeah. you know, I, I have I have 50 employees worldwide, but they are worldwide. And so yeah. I've, I don't have a lot of U.S. employees in my business. And But as I look at that, that's going to be changing this year. And oh, yeah. it's a question for me, should I elect C-Corp? And I think that this is really important for people to start thinking and planning about. So it's so good sure. you bring that up because this is stuff that I do think about is like, you know, but most business owners don't. It's like all of a sudden, they, yeah. hit, they go, well, I wish I did that last year. Right. You should consult a professional. That's why I brought yeah. you on here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> call, call me now because I got nothing but, I should say nothing <laughs> time. Call me now because this is the best time to talk to me because we can take a look at the, the return that you just filed and we can actually go over and say, well, if we make these adjustments now, this is what it's going to mean for you by the end of the year. And, and yeah. a lot of what we've been doing is we've been shifting away from individual returns and doing more, more tax and business planning. We've even you know, done some international consulting where we've got you know, multiple companies that have licensing agreements and we can actually structure the income in a very effective way. And it's all legal. You, know, you, you have to make sure that you know, it basically passes the duck test. You know, is this a, an actual transaction? Are we actually moving money around? We're not just saying that we're paying yeah. a fee and then bearing the money out back. Like, we're doing things the right way. Yeah. But just an ounce of, was, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And when you're talking about cutting your tax rate in half, I mean, what business owner would want to, you know, yeah. take probably their biggest expense honestly at the end of the day especially service professionals and cut that right out i mean yeah. if you go from thirty thousand to fifteen thousand that's a lot of money back in your pocket it really is so i actually it didn't i thought i was going to get hit this year from the because my oldest daughter aged out and yeah. of course they changed that and but right. my two i have two younger ones but they got more so it actually balanced out and i netted the same so it actually <laughs> worked out even for me where yeah. most people got got a different hit but i it didn't oh, yeah. happen to me that way so i was well, like <laughs> and, and with so with the structuring with archer tax groups taxes you know our, our income pretty much doubled between 17 and 18, but because of the way that we structured the business and took on specific deductions and focused on key things, even though our, our AGI was almost double, our tax rate actually, our, our, I should say our effective tax rate, not the marginal tax rate, because that's what you pay on every dollar at a certain point, but the, the average of the marginal, or I'm sorry, the effective tax rate between the two years, we actually dropped 2% in our taxes. So we had way more income, we had significantly less, less taxes, um, and, and so I think for small business owners, there's a lot of gifts in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that if your professional doesn't know about them, they're probably leaving quite a bit of money on the table. I mean, the, <laughs> the qualified business income alone, you know, knowing to structure your income around that and say, I don't want to make more than, you know, what, $317,000, I think, is the married filing joint limit. That's a 20% deduction off of your business income coming from any S-Corp partnership or, or sole member LLC. That's a big chunk of change if you're talking about once again, hundred thousand dollars. It's a twenty thousand dollar reduction that you get, no questions asked. Sign me all day, every day. I'll take take twenty yeah. percent return on investment. You know, I just did a, I just did some research into um, the. Um, the the people who whether they elect business or not, but the no. uh, av the small small to medium sized business enterprises with uh, identified with zero employees. There's 5.5 million of them who, with oh, zero yeah. employees here in the U S mm -hmm. and when you look at that size of that number, they're doing everything themselves. They're doing right. all these things. But the shocking number to me was less than 68% of them make over or 68% of them make $200,000 or less. Yep. in revenue. So right. they're not even making a ton of revenue to begin right. with. And yet, you know, thinking about it, if you could save two to 3%, that's that amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Why well, not? Would, you could do more would, business with that. Yeah. that. That would pay for, for my, you know, we, we normally charge somewhere between like two and $10,000, depending on the, the complexity for a tax plan with the aim that we're going to save you at least three times our fee for the next three years. So having a good professional and even just, you know, sitting down with them on a quarterly basis and just saying, what can we be doing to optimize and having someone that, that actually studies the law and keeps up on the trends. I, I was appalled at the number of tax professionals that have no idea about the tax cuts and jobs act. And, and I'll be the first one to kind of call our, our industry of 
we get so complacent of this is the way that it's always been done. They've been changed since the eighties. Yeah. Some credits will come and fall away. Some, some will stick around. If you're going to be working with small businesses and, and, and being invited into this person's financial life, which is a huge, huge step, I think for a lot of people to just open up about, Hey, this is what I'm doing with my business. You need to be a, an actual professional. You need to keep up with trends. You need to have, take continuing education that, that matters because I mean, how many businesses out there do you think these small businesses that are just starting out could benefit from a, a research and development tax credit? There are so many different people in, in the crypto space that are just starting out that if they knew that they could structure themselves in a qualified opportunity zone, they could actually get investors easier because they're a tax advantage investment vehicle. There's so many things that, that just knowing these, these little tips and tricks makes all the difference in the world. And, and it, I mean, even if it's not me, please reach out to, to good professionals and do your research and, and don't be afraid to dig into it and ask questions. Yeah. Oh, you're so right, Drew. Thank you for sharing that because, you know, I agree. I, that, that is a big difference. Um, I think that, you know, the part of what I've, I've been doing business for over 25 years. So, mm -hmm. and I always saw myself as a business owner and not an entrepreneur because it just no. wasn't really the term when I first started. And because of that, there were professionals at your access and you were always urged right. to do that. And, and so that made sense back then, but now we get in this entrepreneurial mindset and we think we don't, you know, well, we can do all this ourselves and we have TurboTax and we'll be fine. Right. But that's not advice. But it's yeah. not advising you. <laughs> Tur TurboTax is great if, if you've got a simple W-2. I, mean, I think you've got an app now that you can literally just snap a picture of your W-2. If that's all you've got going on, awesome. But if you've got, you know, dependents that are in college, you know, or you're divorced, you don't know who actually gets to claim the dependent, there's a bunch of penalties and issues that can crop up and uh, gosh, the number of people that I see, you know, when they claim their cell phone expense, I see that the monthly cell phone payments, but they bought a brand new iPhone in that year and they don't realize that they can expense it instead of depreciating it right away. I mean, anything under $2,500, you can expense and not have to worry about depreciation and have that business expense right away. I mean, our, our go-to every year is, you know, my wife and I are in alternating years. This is my year. I finally get a new phone. Um, but we go <laughs> December, December 31st, we go get the new phone and because we're paying an installment plan on the phone through Verizon. I can still take the full value of the phone December 31st in that tax year. And so I get this, this tax benefit without having to spend a thousand dollars up front. So it's just things like that that make all the difference in the world. Like just learn to structure and learn to ask and, and ask yourself, can I make this a business expense? Is it reasonable and necessary? And is it a, a usual expense in my industry? Uh, oh, so, so important. I'm so glad you're here. Um, yeah. Can you, is there anything else in the crypto space or in, you know, what you've been seeing going on in the blockchain research world that like yeah. that people may not be thinking about that they could really take advantage of? Yeah, certainly. I think, I think for me, the, the biggest thing, so I've kind of shifted how I look at tokens, you know, kind of on a, a macro level. Um, I am not really concerned with getting, you know, 1000% super sexy returns, you know, once every three years in a, a crazy bull run. I've moved a lot more of my portfolio into things like KuCoin shares or other stakeable or notable tokens. A lot of people don't realize that by uh, running a master node, because you're putting effort into setting that up and running it, you can treat that as a business. So all of the crypto that you're buying for that, we could actually treat as a, a piece of a you know, business investment, take up the expense there. Now you have to remember if you do that, you're gonna have zero basis when you turn around and sell it later. But all the coins that you receive, are treated as income. So then you can use your cell phone bill, you can you know, use a home office deduction against that income and basically accumulate crypto without having to pay taxes on it. And it's something I think is a, a huge benefit to people. I think a lot more projects are moving to proof of stake over proof of work. Um, and there's always been you know, the rumblings that Ethereum is gonna be proof of stake at some point. But I mean, I think they've been saying that for two years now and, and every project's got their, their hype for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's, such, that's so important. So, I mean, here again, we're yeah. talking about like really thinking and looking at stuff from a business perspective right. and not just like a hobby perspective, which is right. really a big difference here because, yeah. you know, whether you realize it or not, you are an acting business. You're making money on your money and you're making money yeah. on your time. That's business. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people too. So the other like big shift that I've seen since we talked at Chain Exchange um, is we've seen a lot more projects go for away from the ICO model as it was and just selling it on the open market. Um, you know, the Securities Commission has, has really cracked down on, on bad actors, I would say. And there's still a lot of confusion on, you know, do we actually have utility tokens or, or is everything a security? So we've seen a lot more projects shift to just going for the security filing right away. And they're doing things like using Reg CF, which, you know, you can fundraise and crowdfund the first thing 1.02 million. Yep. Um, 
and, and basically get a project started. And instead of raising $35 million, if, if you think that you can fundraise and, and sell those tokens, a million dollars will get you quite a bit of runway and get you a legitimate product to start bringing on other investors on the back end to kind of grow. But I don't think we're going to see the ICO mania that we saw in the past. I think it's going to be mostly investment driven and speculation more so than anything else, unless there's a, an actual use for the token or it provides some sort of value outside of, I hold this so it has value. It's not getting burnt or destroyed or disappearing and, or it could be used as, you know, a, a money equivalent than, than the, to, in my mind, the, the the project's worthless. I think that's why we've seen a lot of altcoins just drop like flies. Yeah. They raise a ton of money and they haven't produced anything in, in a year and a half and everyone's kind of walked away from the project and the market kind of shook out. And I think that's a good thing overall. Yeah. Well, and I, I've also seen a lot of this problem with exchange issues. So like, oh you know, yeah, that's like the biggest problem. So people buy into a fund and they think they're doing right. well and they think this is great and they see a valuation, but there's no place to exchange them or the exchanges didn't right. take them in like they expected them to. Or this is the one that really shocked a bunch of people. It ended up like reverse mortgaging. So like no. you, instead of a, a reverse split is what I mean. So yeah. instead of getting like a split stock and you get like two, right, you're going right. to, you're going to get they're a half mortgaging. and people yeah. are like, what the heck? my value dropped. I was like, well, it didn't actually, but it feels right. like that to you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Some big problems going on here, but <laughs> oh, yeah. well, we've got the, what the happenings coming up here soon, which is going to create to me, at least a very interesting case study. You know, I don't know how quite to play that just yet from a, an investment standpoint, but I try to stick to my taxes. I try not to get too creative. I'll, I'll let my, my uh, brainier friends that are, you know, market TA experts, I'll let them tell me what I need to be doing in the weeks leading up to it, but we'll see. Well, you know, that's really, really the last question I think I have for you is like, how do you yeah. stay up on what's going on? Because it does seem like things are changing and precedents are being set. Like, how yeah. do you do that? So I, I try to find a group of people that, you know, we're all really good at our specific field. There's a couple of different discord groups that I'm a part of. Um, there's some groups that I've been invited into and I've been into a lot of the meetups out here in Colorado. And you have to invest the time if you're not going to pay for, you know, Signaling groups are, are good if they're good. If it's someone just kind of pulling it out of their butt and kind of making it up as they go and they, they're not really doing anything, it's not, not worth it. So this is not like an endorsement of all paid groups or you know groups together. You know, I think Reddit used to be a really good resource and it's kind of fallen away with just kind of people throwing crap at each other. Like, over who can you trust there is my, always yeah. my question. is like, is this trustworthy well, or not? Yeah. But, but it's free. And that's yeah. the thing is if you're not going to spend the money on it, then you have to spend the, the time on it. But yeah. We try to keep up on the tax part because it lets me sit down with you know programmers and developers and say, what are you doing in your project? What do you see going on here? Here's what I think that you guys could be doing based on that with the tax side. And we have some mutual value to share in between. So become an expert in something and you'll get invited into a lot more um, groups and, and industry, you know, um, things like that. We actually have been working with the governor's blockchain council quite a bit on the taxation side out here. We've met some really sharp attorneys and, and have you know really met some really good people on the security side things that I would have never had exposure to. In, yeah. In well, we've been video. hearing some interesting things about go, stuff going on in Wyoming as oh, well. Yeah. And so, and that's just across the border. Yeah. So not too far well, from you. <laughs> and, and Colorado's, we're, we're a little bit anxious that they're eating our lunch. You know, uh, <laughs> the, the legislation out here is trending more favorable, even though I would say Wyoming to a certain degree. They can expedite it through because it's, you know, I don't want to say it's a smaller state, but it, it's a smaller state. It is um, technically a smaller state by, and, by population. And, oh, by a significant <laughs> amount. Yeah. And, and I've got a lot of friends up in Wyoming and, you know, they, they come down and do meetups and stuff like that and, we, you know, give each other some razzing and stuff like that. Um, but the, the big thing, honestly, is um, Colorado's got a really great tech culture. Our uh, governor, Jared Polis, actually ran on blockchain issues in his platform. And so we've got a pro-crypto governor. We've got a pretty good advocacy group in the governor's blockchain council and a lot of the state senators and legislators want to see this develop and so we've been passing things that you know better securities laws and things like that and, and i'm a little bit out of the loop right now because i've been head down with tax season but i mean the, the legislature's in session i think right now and we're probably going to start you know in my opinion eating wyoming's lunch <laughs> very quickly well, uh, I look forward to that because my family yeah. has a house in Colorado, so there was nothing I would like more to, yeah, yeah. to, put, well, to move my C Corp there. <laughs> well, all, all we need to do, so, so where we're at in Longmont, we're in what's one of those QOZs, and that's those zones that you can defer capital gains. So you just take some of that crypto that you've been holding for forever, sell that, buy, buy a building in a QOZ, renovate the building, turn it into an incubator and a headquarters for your C Corp, defer the, the taxes on it, get a, a price break on it, and then 10 years when you sell a building, 
because you've built this massive community around it and all the property values have gone up, you actually have no capital gains because the basis becomes the, the fair market value. So there's all these strategies of just Ow. moving around. And okay, it, now you just blew my mind. Now I got to rethink right? some things. <laughs> I love it. We're going to so keep going. Like next weekend? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love it. Well, Drew, thank you so much for being on the show yeah. today. I really appreciate it. You, you, got, you have really opened my eyes and I'm sure you've done the same thing for our audience. Um, I will make sure that everyone knows how to reach you in the blog yeah, post absolutely. for this for this episode at newtrusteconomy.com. Um, but th- wow. I mean, yeah. get, get some rest, go on vacation, <laughs> get to the beach, right? Get out toes, there. Toes in the sand, gin and tonic in my hand. And then, and, and, you know, by the end of April, I'll be back. <laughs> uh, I, I'm putting out a very nice, like, we love our clients. You guys are great. We've really enjoyed this tax season. I'm on a beach. There should be nothing that's on fire. Please please leave us alone. Like the let I'll, us I'll, rest. I'll, right. I'll still be checking my email. Let's, let's not, let's not, <laughs> like I won't be. but yeah, you know, check out, check out our website. We have a contact page. We actually do free 15 minute consultations. So any questions that you have, we want to give you those tools as much as we can. And we're actually working on developing. We've, we've kicked around the idea of doing a video series of just like, how do I, you know, as a small business owner, how do I get enough education to know, you know, what is payroll tax? What is an LLC actually? What is a partnership? What is an escort? So that people can start arming themselves and start being more more intentional about having to come and pay us to do it. So we'll keep an eye out for that. I'll probably be by the end of June is when we'll be releasing that. <laughs> yeah, after the season, you'll get onto those right. things. I love it. I love it. Well, you know, when you when you give an update like that, and yeah. send us a message here, and we'll make sure to post in the blog post because you never know when someone might be listening to it. it might already be June. Yeah, so awesome. we would love that. Well, yeah. thanks again, Drew. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. New Trust Economy listeners, thank you so much for being with me today. Um, I am really glad that you all survived your tax season yourselves and are moving on, but maybe some of you filed some extensions and you're confused. So I want to make sure that you do go to the blog post at newtrusteconomy.com or reach out to us anywhere on social at New Trust Economy and we'll connect you right up with Drew. Thanks again for listening. This has been Tracy Hazard.